Okay. My uh, primary collaborators for the past few years have been Mani Mani Vanan and Tom Greenbow, who's a chemist, and John Thompson, who's at the University of Maine. We've had a number of graduate students who've contributed very significantly to the work that I'm going to discuss, including my current PhD student, Warren Christensen, who is finishing up his uh, PhD in physics at Iowa State University this summer. And we've been very fortunate to get um, funding from the U.S. National Science Foundation pretty steadily for the past 12 years from several different divisions most recently from the Division of Physics. <clears throat> so I'm going to start out by talking generally about treating physics education as a research problem and discuss specifically physics education research in the United States. I'll talk a little bit about the instructional methods that are developed based on this research and the, the methods of curriculum development that are based on physics education research. And I'll uh, then talk about the work we've done in thermal physics as a more detailed example of uh, this process. So it's only relatively recently, roughly the past 25 years or so, that physicists at colleges and universities have treated the learning and teaching of physics as a research problem. What I mean by that is to carry out systematic observations, collection of data. I've exceeded my profile storage. Does it care? Let's see if I can make that go away. So we carry out these systematic observations and create experiments that can be reproduced at diverse institutions with different student populations and different instructors. We work very hard at identifying the many variables that are involved in teaching and learning. We, we do our best to control those variables in these experiments. And the key part of the process is we probe students' thinking in great detail. We uh, investigate exactly how they go about the process of learning physics. And this has broadly come to be known as physics education research, or PER for short. Particularly in the United States, that's how it's uh, called. The goals of PER are Basically very simple, they're improve the effectiveness and efficiency of physics instruction with a, a special focus on getting students to learn concepts in greater depth than is customary in, in, current, uh, um, in current teaching. We develop instructional materials and we develop instructional methods that address the difficulty students encounter as they go about learning physics. We develop these innovative instructional methods and we assess them critically to see whether they're working whether they work better, how well they work, and, and then to improve them. The, the methodology that we use begins from a set of questions. We call them diagnostic questions because we're trying to diagnose students' thinking, so to speak. They're basically physics questions and physics problems that probe student understanding of particular concepts. Then we, we investigate student, student thinking in, in depth by basically by getting them to explain their reasoning. We get them to explain their reasoning either by having them write explanations uh, um, of, of how they solve written problems on quizzes and exams, uh, or by having them uh, explain their reasoning verbally in a one-on-one in -on -one interview, for instance. And we assess learning by measuring, by applying some sort of a measure both before instruction begins and at the very end, at the end of the course, to see whether hopefully something has changed. But it's important to recognize that there are some things that PER really can't do, should never be asked to try to do. For instance, to develop, to determine the philosophical approach that an instructor has toward education. And what I mean is, some instructors might want to focus on the broad majority of the students in the class, but others might want to focus on just the very best in the class, uh, or perhaps at the other end. And so that's a philosophical decision that the instructor will make. Also, the specific goals that one has in a particular learning con uh, context can vary from one instructor to the next. Some instructors might really focus on conceptual qualitative understanding, but others might be interested in mathematical problem solving ability. And so those are the types of things that PER cannot address. It can just help, make an help one make an informed decision. This is a not quite complete list of the PER departments in in the United States, this is just those in the PhD granting departments. There are many others besides. There are a total of about 80 physics departments in the United States that are involved in this kind of work. These are the ones that grant PhDs. And you see that it, it's sort of divided up 
into uh, those that are relatively old, these here. They've been around for a while. And those that are relatively, although they're getting older, but these are sort of the new generation. And then there's the ones in between. And you get most of the PhDs are generated from the departments over here on the left. Now, what, the, what is the role of researchers in physics education? What are, the, what are they trying to do? Well, they carry out investigations of student thinking in depth. And they provide the basis for what's, what's come to be called uh, pedagogical content knowledge. And I'll describe that in more detail in a moment. But it basically means uh, the, the best ways to teach a particular topic, the most effective ways. And researchers in this field develop courses and assess courses and curriculum materials, both for uh, general education, that is, physics courses that most that uh, non-science students might take, or science majors in another field, but also courses for advanced undergraduate courses that physics majors might take, junior and senior physics majors, for instance, quantum mechanics, uh, electricity, magnetism, and, and so on. And also courses for teacher preparation. That is a big focus of many researchers in this field, including myself. In fact, the, uh, there has been a lot of progress in teacher preparation courses in physics in the United States based on the research that's been done in physics education. And so there have been changes made uh, in, ma in many places where the new teacher preparation programs are very directly based on the research that's been done in physics learning and that use the research-based materials and the research-based instructional methods. And just as a couple of examples that you might have heard about, the physics by inquiry curriculum that was developed at the University of Washington over the past 30 years based on a lot of research and has been very widely adopted for teacher preparation programs, particularly in the United States. It's also been used in a number of other, a number of European countries as well. Um, and the so-called modeling workshops uh, from Arizona State University that are um, given to high school teachers who are actually already in, um, on the job. So this uh, pedagogical content knowledge, uh, this term comes from um, an educational researcher named Shulman about 20 years ago. And he described it as the knowledge that one needs to, te to teach a specific topic effectively. That is, it's knowledge that goes beyond knowledge of the content of the material. Physicists, of course, understand the physics. They understand the content. And specialists in ed education know a lot about teaching methods and teaching theory. But what we're talking about here is something that goes beyond that. It's the specific ways of formulating a particular subject that make it comprehensible to others, and in particular, an understanding of what makes the learning of specific topics easy or difficult. These are the words of Shulman. So it's very much, very much focused on specific subjects, specific topics. A knowledge of the teaching strategies most likely to be fruitful. Not general teaching strategies, but teaching strategies as applied to specific areas. So this is very much the focus of physics education researchers. There are some general results that have come out of this research. And I should say that it's not just physics education research, but research and science education in general that leads to some of these ideas. First of all, that, there are, that students have conceptual and reasoning difficulties that are very much subject specific. They are relate to specific topics. And that these difficulties play a significant role, or can play a significant role, in uh, hindering student learning. It's more, though, than simply the student's knowledge of particular concepts. It's the way students' knowledge is organized. Uh, what we find is that students may have lots of ideas, but they're not linked together very well. They don't know how one idea relates to the other. And more than that, they have trouble accessing the knowledge that they have, because it's not well organized in their memory. And so one of the things that, that uh, education has to address is that organization of knowledge. And another issue that's significant is students' beliefs about how they need to go about learning and the way they try to learn physics. And I'll discuss this more in a moment. But we find that in many cases, that just the way students try to go about learning physics is, causes them difficulties. So let me talk about instructional methods that are based on this research. The basic idea is that one recognizes that students have they come to class with a certain so-called pre-instruction knowledge state. In other words, they come to class with a variety of ideas and practices, some of which involve specific learning difficulties related to specific topics or specific concepts in physics. They also have ideas that may be productive, that may be useful, if the instructor can guide them in, in how to apply those ideas properly. 
And they also have certain ways in which they go about learning, which has come from their previous education. Some of these, some of these methods may be good, and some of them may be not effective. So what the research-based instruction attempts to do is to address the difficulties that have been identified through research, mainly through carefully designed sequences of problems and activities, a lot of discussion where students actually talk uh, both with the instructor and with other students as they work through problems, and Socratic dialogue where the instructor tends to lead the students more by asking them questions um, than by giving them answers. Now, how much one does that depends on the context. There are some specific issues that have been identified as, as very significant uh, for most students. Particularly in the introductory courses, uh, many, if not most students, develop relatively weak qualitative understanding of concepts. And what I mean by that is that they, for instance, do not use qualitative analysis when they solve problems. And this is very much in contrast to the way an expert goes about solving problems in terms of using graphs and diagrams and so on, um, drawing pictures, the types of things that an expert often does and an introductory student frequently does not do. Also, part of this lack of qualitative reasoning, qualitative understanding, is that if students do not have an equation, if they don't have a quantitative solution to a problem, they have difficulty reasoning physically. Excuse me. What I mean is that if you ask them a question about, well, will this, will this quantity get larger or smaller? Will this object go to the left or to the right? Uh, is, is something changing or not changing? A qualitative question, if they don't have an equation, they have difficulty answering that because they, they are used to trying to always use algebra to come up with their answers. And in general, we say that they lack a functional understanding of concepts. That is to say, they lack an understanding of the concepts that would allow them to solve problems in unfamiliar contexts, a context different from that in which they learned the concept. On the other hand, there, certainly some students do learn very efficiently. And I like to say that the, the, the students who are very successful in learning physics are active learners in this sense. They, these, this type of student will probe their understanding, always be um, trying to look at their own thinking in a variety of ways. For instance, they ask, them, they ask their own questions. They ask questions of themselves, even when the instructor has not posed a question. They're always looking for assumptions that are not necessarily stated explicitly in the statement of problems. They're always looking at different contexts. The, they might get a, a, a problem that's given to them in one situation, and then they think about how they would modify this and look at it in a slightly different situation. And they do this, the, the successful physics learners, on their own in some sense. They, they, they figured out that this is an effective method. Another thing is that they're always, or they are usually sensitive to areas where they are not understanding the concepts well, where they're confused about something but they have the confidence that even though they don't understand something well, they can work at it and think about it and talk about it and eventually figure it out. However, most of the students in the introductory courses are not able to do this kind of efficient learning on their own. In a sense, they literally don't know what questions they need to ask. And that's where they need guidance from instructors and from appropriate curriculum materials, helping them figure out the questions they need to be asking. So what the research suggests is that, is that if one has problem, one uses problem solving activities with rapid feedback, you can, that can produce good learning gains. And what I mean by rapid feedback is that students get some feedback on, what, on, their, on their answers within just a minute or two or three on a very small time scale. And there's various ways of doing that. Another key point is that when these common conceptual difficulties that students have are explicitly addressed in instruction in some form or another, and I'll describe how, again, learning can be improved. The, the term that has come to be used uh, um, to refer to the, the research-based instruction in physics is uh, interactive engagement. That's a commonly used term. It's not universally used, but it is common. This was a term introduced by Richard Hake about 10 years ago. It typically includes problem solving activities during class time. So not just lectures, but also problem solving during class. 
typically, again, involving students working in groups, typically uh, groups of two or three or four. A lot of question and answer exchanges between the students and the instructor and among the students themselves. And again, very characteristic form of instruction is so-called guided inquiry methodology where students are guided by leading questions, again, asking the students questions rather than giving them answers, through a, a carefully set, structured series of problems that are based on research into student uh, learning and student understanding. The goal, if one were to put it in one phrase, is to try to get students to figure things out for themselves as much as possible. This is a, a, a term that Haik used. Now, the extent to which one does this, again, is very dependent on the instructional context. We don't expect students to figure out um, quantum mechanics all by themselves. We don't expect introductory students to figure out Newton's laws by themselves. But we expect them to figure out steps along the way so that we don't simply hand them a completely developed theory and then expect them to apply that where they haven't made some effort to figure out and understand the theory on their own along the way. I'll, again, I'll describe this in more detail. So some of the, the key points of this form of instruction are to emphasize qualitative questions, non-numerical, non-algebraic questions, to try to get students away from this, this procedure that you know, we call plug and chug, where they simply take numbers, they put them into equations, and they grind away doing algebra to come up with an answer. And they don't really think about what's happening physically. And so we, try, by avoiding quantitative problems, we try to force students to really focus on the physics. Make, we make a lot of use of so-called multiple representations uh, to help students broaden their understanding. And here I mean things like using graphs, using diagrams, using uh, computer simulations and computer animations and so on to give a, provide different context in which the students can consider the ideas. And we get students to, uh, this is a crucial point, to, we get students to explain their reasoning, to either write explanations of their solutions or to, uh, to, say, to give a verbal explanation, either to the instructor or to other students with whom they're working. In large classes, one can apply this. Uh, the, my group has done this in uh, using some specific methods to try to apply this type of active learning in a large lecture class, where you might have several hundred students. First of all, we de-emphasize lecturing a lot. And instead of, instead of the instructor talking, we focus the class on getting students to respond to questions, where the questions are targeted at difficulties that research has shown students tend to have. We use some kind of classroom communication system to get instantaneous feedback from all the students. And the very popular right now are these electronic clickers where each student has a little input device and they can just signal their answer to a question. But we've also used printed cards. And I'll show a picture of that in a moment. Those are also very effective and very cheap and very easy to implement. We get students to work in groups in some fashion. And even in a room like this where the seats are fixed and it's hard for the students to work with each other, it's still possible for people can uh, turn to each other, the people who are sitting right next to them or right behind them or right in front of them. They can still work in groups at least to a limited extent. And we do this with um, a variety of question types, that, as I'll describe. The goal here is to try to transform the learning environment that you have in a large lecture room. There might be a, a room with, like this one with a couple of hundred students. But we try to transform the environment so it's more like the environment one has in the office. If you're the instructor in an office with just one student there or two students there, to try to make it more of a small room type of environment, even if there are 200 students there. And one of the ways we do this is we, we have developed these sequences of multiple choice questions. And uh, my, my colleague and I, Manivanan, and I have called our method the fully interactive physics lecture. And what we do is we have developed sequences of multiple choice questions, where each sequence of questions focuses on some specific concept, and where the steps between one question and the next are relatively small. So you're, there's not a big jump from one question to the next in terms of the difficulty of the question. And we pose these questions to the students. We get them to give us answers. And we use some kind of response system. So we get instantaneous answers from everybody in the class simultaneously. This is a variant of uh, the method that's been popularized by Eric Mazur at Harvard, which he calls peer instruction. And he has publicized this method for more than 10 years, more than 15 years by now, I guess. 
So this is a variant of peer instruction, what I'm describing here. And we, what we have done for quite a few years is simply have the students have packs of cards. The cards are labeled A, B, C, D, E, F. And we ask them multiple choice questions, and they just signal their answer by holding up a card. It actually works very well. And you can see right away whether everybody's giving you the right answer, which is fine. Then you can go on to the next question. Or what often happens is that they're split. You know, one of the, some of the, half the class might give you A, and the half the class will say D. And you have to have a discussion, or they have to first discuss it to see if they can work out, resolve the problem. Uh, the, we have done assessment of the learning in our classes using these methods. And basically what we find is that the learning gains th we show for students on performing on qualitative questions are well above what are observed in traditional classes using standard met methods of instruction. And on quantitative questions, and we don't stress the, in the particular class I'm talking about, there's not a lot of stress on quantitative problems. Nonetheless, we find that students perform well on quantitative questions, at least as well as students in traditional classes. And this, is, this type of results, good performance on, on qualitative questions and at least equivalent performance on quantitative questions, that's typical of the results of other research-based instructional methods. So just to talk about this, this um, and the more details about this, the type of a sequence, question sequence that we use, we have a set of closely related multiple choice questions that, as I said, focus on a specific concept. They progress in the sequence, the questions progress from easy to hard. We use lots of multiple representations, lots of diagrams and graphs and so on. And there's an emphasis on qualitative questions. So this, I don't expect you to read this, but this is an example of one of our question sequences on electrical forces. It starts out with questions that are really very easy to build the student's confidence in giving us answers. Uh, uses uh, a variety of diagrammatic methods, and the questions get harder as they go along. They start out with just asking for the directions of forces, then they have to work out to compare the magnitudes of the forces on different charges, where they have to invoke the inverse square law, and so on. And then they actually become pretty challenging towards the end. Just to show you some of the assessment data and the ways we try to see whether these are successful, we have given our students um, a set of questions from the Conceptual Survey on Electricity and Magnetism, which is a set of qualitative questions that's been developed and published uh, by researchers in the United States. Now, the results of this have been published. This test has been administered to several thousand, stu stu several thousand students around the United States, and the results have been published in the American Journal of Physics. Um, the types of questions on this exam, as I say, are qualitative questions. This is an example of one of them. This shows a series of diagrams with equal potential lines. And the question, and I don't know if you can read that, the question is, um, this particular question is uh, to determine, to compare the magnitude of the electric field at point B in these three situations. So the idea is that students are supposed to see that the, the magnitude of the electric field will be larger where the equal potential lines are closer together. So that's an example of a question on this test. Here's another example of a question from this conceptual survey. Another question involving equal potential lines. In this case, it's a, um, uh, the field looks a little bit different. And the students are supposed to compare the magnitude of the force that would be exerted on a proton placed at these two different locations, both magnitude and direction. So that's the type of questions that are on this conceptual survey that we've used. When this has been administered to uh, classes around the country, around the United States, we find that the pretest score on this test, on this, uh, test is in the courses that are the algebra-based courses, the courses that the, the biology majors would take, the pre-instruction score is about 20, 27%. What I mean there is when you give this test on the first day of class, so the students are coming to it only with the knowledge they learned in, in high school physics, for instance, they scored about 27% in the algebra-based course. And then in the course that the engineers take, the calculus-based course, the pre-instruction score is higher, about 37%. Then when this test is given on the last day of class, after a full semester of instruction in electricity magnetism, typically what is found is that the scores have moved up to about 40 to 50% in traditional courses. Um, and this is uh, the so-called Hake gain, or the normalized gain, which is the fraction of an, uh, incorrect answers that have been corrected by the post-test. So 
22% of the answers that were wrong at the beginning have been fixed by the end, which is not a very high percentage. In our course, what we found is that the pre-instruction score was uh, consistent with what had been observed at other courses around the country. Our course was an algebra-based class. Most of the students were biology students, not engineering students. And so the pre-instruction score is about 30%. But the scores that we got post-instruction on the last day of class were well above 70%. And the, uh, the gain we got was above about 0.7. So these are very high numbers. What that's telling us, at least, is that at least some of our objectives of student learning have been met by the form of instruction I described. But, uh, but, uh, now, I've just described their performance on qualitative questions. Of course, a key question is how do they do on, on quantitative questions? And so what we did was to ask students some questions that were um, taken from the course that the engineering students took. They, we, didn't use students that, uh, we did not use questions that involved calculus. We'd use questions that simply involved algebraic uh, computations. So we selected some questions that we just drew them from the final exams that the engineers took in their course. And the, and the, the scores that the engineering students got were about 50 to 60% on these questions. And in our class, which was the biology students, uh, a smaller sample, but nonetheless, what we found is a consistent result that our students did well on these quantitative questions uh, as well. So they didn't just do well in the qualitative questions, but they did well in the quantitative questions also. Let me turn to a discussion of the curriculum development methods we use uh, with, uh, based on research. We start out by investigating student learning with standard instruction in the courses they're taking now, and we try to probe the learning difficulties. And then we develop new materials based on this research. Then we test and we modify them, and we just iterate. That's an iterative process until we're satisfied with uh, the student performance. So here's an, I just want to show an example of how we've done this. This is a project I did with one of my former students, Jack Dostel, on student concepts of gravitation. We gave a set of questions. These were non-multiple choice questions. And we gave it to essentially all of the students taking general physics, introductory physics, at Iowa State University. Uh, in, in a full academic year. That's where I used to teach. It was at Iowa State. So these questions involve things like Newton's third law in the context of gravity, the inverse square law, and so on. And then we developed worksheets, uh, sets of problem sheets that were designed to address the difficulties we found in research. So this is an example of one of the questions we asked on this test. This just, this is a very simple question. This is a very simple situation. We have the Earth and, a, and an asteroid, and we ask the students, is the magnitude of the force exerted by the asteroid on the Earth larger than, smaller than, or the same as the magnitude of the force exerted by the Earth on the asteroid? Explain the reasoning for your choice. And this was given to all the students taking uh, on the first day of class. Now, I should say that the students in, who take uh, the calculus-based physics course at Iowa State have almost all had high school physics. So about 90% of them have studied physics before have studied Newtonian mechanics previous to this. Uh, of course, this is an example of Newton's third law question. We, the answer is that the forces are the same magnitude. But we found that only 15% of the students gave a correct answer to this question on the first day of class. This is in the first semester class. Now, th they then study mechanics for a full uh, 15 weeks, and then they take the next semester of the course. We gave the question there as well, and we found that the results improved up to 38%, but it's still not a very high correct response rate. It was still the case that most of the students would argue that because the Earth was larger, it exerted the greater force. So to try to address this, we use the model that has been publicized by Lillian McDermott's group at the University of Washington now for, quite, for more than 20 years, what they call elicit, confront, and resolve. They pose questions to students in which they tend to encounter common conceptual difficulties. And then you allow the students to commit themselves to a response that reflects that difficulty if the student actually has the problem. And then you guide the students along a track of reasoning that bears on the same concept. And then you get the students to compare their answer with their previous response and to resolve any discrepancies. So with this form of instruction, a, a key part of the um, the curriculum reform is to develop these worksheets, which are these sets of written problems that we use to guide students' thinking. They are sets of their closely linked problems, and they focus on the conceptual difficulties that have been identified in research. Uh, they very much emphasize qualitative reasoning, <clears throat> and they're designed for use by students in small groups, as I said, two or three or four students. 
the, what the instructor does is provide guidance by asking questions and avoiding giving direct answers. <clears throat> so an example is this worksheet that Jack and I developed, <clears throat> which targeted <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> difficulties with Newton's third law and the use of uh, proportional reasoning with the inverse square law. And here's an excerpt from the worksheet. We start out with a very simple question. We ask the students to draw an arrow representing the force exerted by the Earth on the person to make sure that they're drawing their arrows uh, pointed in the right direction, which they d don't always do. The next question then shows the Earth and the Moon and says to draw an arrow representing the force exerted by the Earth on the Moon and label that B. And then the next question is to draw an arrow which represents the force exerted by the Moon on the Earth and label that C. And this is a very common student response. They would draw arrows of unequal length. And then they turn the page and they get to the next page which, which asks them to um, write an algebraic expression for the magnitude of the force corresponding to the force of the moon on the earth, earth on the moon. And then the next question asks them to write an algebraic expression for the force of the moon on the earth. And of course, they realize when they look at it that it's the same expression. We then ask them to see whether their answers are consistent with the diagram that they drew. And what we see is they turn the page back. They see that they have the arrows that are unequal length. And they just erase it and they fix it. And we saw many, many dozens of students carry out exactly that procedure. And, um, and that's, that's sort of what we want them to do. And then we test the results. And again, we gave some, put some simple questions on the final exam with the, uh, with the agreement of the instructor. This is, all, this is not a course that we were teaching. And uh, hmm. that's a little more serious. Up, up. Here we go. OK. Yeah, this is the question we, one of the questions we put on the final exam. This asks the students to compare the magnitude of the gravitational force exerted by um, Saturn on a chunk of ice in Saturn's rings and the force exerted on Saturn by that chunk of ice. And so, of course, the answer we're looking for is that the, gravi those, the magnitudes of those forces are the same. What we found is that the students who had used the worksheets, and that's the group in blue, had a significantly higher correct response rate than the group in red, um, well above well, uh, much larger than, as you see, than the error bars. And now we had to apply a correction. There was an issue of whether the students who came to recitation were e equivalent in terms of their per exam performance to the students who did not come to the recitations where they use these worksheets. And so when we applied a correction for that, the difference was smaller, but it was still significant. You never like to rely on the results of a single question. So we had another question on the final exam. And this involved two lead spheres of equal mass at a certain distance. And we say that the masses, one of the masses is doubled and they're pushed to a different separation. And we ask them what happens to the forces in that case. And the uh, answer is that they're equal and they're smaller than the original force. And what we found on this question as well, the students who had used the worksheets in blue had a significantly higher correct response rate than those who did not. And so this is a very simple illustration. Admittedly, this is an extremely simple case. But it's an illustration of, of how we go about this process and the type of results we hope to get through this process of research-based cur uh, curriculum development. So let me close now. Where I will, I will, this will take a few minutes. I'm going to describe in some detail the work we've been doing on thermal physics, because this has been um, the project that my group has been focused on the past few years. And what we are, have been doing is to investigate student learning of both classical and statistical thermodynamics. And we probe the evolution of their thinking, because we, we start looking at them in the introductory course when they take it as freshmen or sophomores. And then we follow them through when, uh, when they're physics majors, we follow them into their more advanced course when they study statistical mechanics. And based on the research, we develop curricular materials. This work is most recently in collaboration with John Thompson, who's at the University of Maine. Now, we had done a lot of work previously, we and others, on students in the introductory courses. And I'm going to summarize that work quickly. There have been studies on students in the general introductory physics course in terms of their learning of thermodynamic concepts. And the results, to, to summarize them briefly, are that the students finish those courses with significant difficulties in many fundamental concepts. They have difficulty understanding just the concepts of heat and work and understanding the first and second laws of thermodynamics, and particularly being able to apply them in problem solving. 
And this is the results of studies both in the United States, in Germany, in France, and the United Kingdom. The results are all pretty consistent over the years that, that lead to these conclusions. So the findings are that in the introductory course, even after instruction, between 40 and 80 percent of the students believe that heat and work are state functions, that they're independent of process, and believe that in a cyclic process that the net work done and the net heat absorbed by, uh, by a system have to be zero in a cyclic process. So they're very confused about that. And in general, they have great difficulty in applying the first law of thermodynamics in solving problems. Now talking now about the upper level course, this is the course for physics majors. Top, it covers both class, macroscopic thermodynamics and statistical mechanics. And here I'm discussing a specific course that I taught at Iowa State University over a two year period. We had um, 14 students enrolled one year and 19 students enrolled in this class the next year. Those are typical enrollments for this course taken only by, well, taken by physics majors and uh, physics engineering double majors. So these were all advanced students. Um, almost all of them were third or fourth year students, juniors or seniors. And they had all studied thermodynamics previously, some of them at an advanced level. And so what I'm going to do here is have a comparison between the res uh, certain the responses to certain questions, both of the students in the introductory course and the students in this more advanced course. Now, the responses were given by the students in the introductory course after they had completed that course. So that's a post-instruction uh, measure. Uh, and we gave these questions to more than 700 students, or more than 600 students, over a four-year period, some of whom gave answers to written questions, and some of whom responded during one-on-one -on -one interviews, where we actually sat down with just one student and asked them a series of questions. And then we gave the same questions to the students in the advanced course. These are the junior or senior physics majors, but here we gave it to them on the first day of class, because presumably they had already learned this material. I should say now that the group of students that came from the interview sample, it was a group of 32 students that, of course, they had a volunteer for this. And uh, it turns out that they were very, they were above average students. So the students that responded to the verbal questions were an above average group. And just to give you a sense of what I mean, this is the grade distribution for all the students in the class of one, that particular year, about 400 students. And then the grade distribution of the students who came to us for interviews. And you see that it was much higher. So the students who the, that we interviewed were above average in terms of their performance. So this is one of the questions we gave. This is a PV diagram that represents a system consisting of a fixed amount of ideal gas that undergoes two different processes in going from state A to state B. And, and these questions, W will represent the work done by the system during the process, and Q represents the heat absorbed by the system during the process. And a couple of the questions we asked were these. One is the work for process one greater than, less than, or equal to that for process number two? And is Q for process one greater than, less than, or equal to that for process two? So let me focus first on this question, the work question. Um, when you're talking about the work done by the system, then you can simply represent that as the integral of PDV or the area under the curve. And then it's uh, easy to see, hopefully it's easy to see from this diagram that the work done in, by pro in process one is larger than the work done in process two. So the answer for this one is greater than. And this is supposed to be a very straightforward question. What we found is that, however, many students thought that the work done would be equal in both cases. So for the students, the seven, 650 students who responded to the written question, about 30% said that the work would be equal in both cases. The, the interview group, that 32 high performing students, about 22% of them gave that answer. And the upper level students, the thermal physics students, the junior physics majors and so on, also about 20% of them gave that answer, which was very surprising that so many would give the answer that the work was equal in those two cases. Some of the explanations that were given, and these are the explanations given by the advanced students, they said that it would be equal because it's path independent. The work is path independent was their claim. The work is the same regardless of the path taken. And so we find that some students associate work with phrases that we know instructors only use for state functions. And of course, they could only have read this in reference to state functions of the book. Somehow they made a connection between those phrases about path independent or regardless, same regardless of the path. They made that association with work. 
And these are the same types of explanations that the introductory students gave us when we asked the question of them. The heat question is more difficult because you have to apply the first law of thermodynamics. The idea is that the internal energy change from state A to state B is the same for both processes. But since work, the system does more work in process one, it has to observe more energy in the form of heat to have the same internal energy change. So Q for process one is greater than that for process two. Again, though, we found many students claim that the heat would be the same in both cases. And this was a higher percentage, somewhere between 40 and 30 and 40 percent. You see that in the introductory course, it was 38 to 47 percent. And then even for the advanced students, we got 30 percent who claimed, who made the same claim. And typically what they said is that similar answers as before. They start at the same place and end at the same place. The heat transfer is the same because they start and end on the same isotherm. So many of these advanced students said, or they implied, that heat transfer was independent of process, the same type of claim that was made by the introductory students. Now, if we look at the correct answer, which is that Q1 is greater than Q2, here's what we found, the percentage of students that gave the correct answer. And it's not very high, but what it's, this is a little peculiar because it seems that the introductory students are doing better than the advanced students. However, when we look more carefully, we have to look at the explanations the students give. And so if we now look at the students who gave the correct answer with the correct explanation, we see something different. These students were giving incorrect explanations, while these students, the ones who gave the correct answer among the advanced students, they, um, they, gave, good an they gave good explanations. And so, let's see. Yeah. I don't know why it does that. So actually, the performance of the upper level students was better than that of the introductory students, but it's still not nearly what you would hope for. So again, what we found is that the students were having difficulty with the first law of thermodynamics. And also, uh, I mentioned before, that they have difficulty with uh, cyclic processes. And I was going to briefly describe this question. I hope it won't take too long. Uh, I'm going to go through this pretty quickly. Keep in mind that the students had about one hour to do this problem, because this was done in the interviews, and they had as much time as they wanted. So a fixed quantity of ideal gas contained within a metal cylinder sealed with a movable fr frictionless insulating piston. Cylinder surrounded by a large container of water with high walls, as shown. And we're going to describe two processes, process number one and process two. So I'll just talk about process one. At the initial time A, the gas, the cylinder, and the water have all been sitting in a room for a long period of time, and all of them are at room temperature. Now, we did not show this diagram to the students, but uh, this is the process that we're going to describe. We're going to go around this, starting from initial state A. So this is what I'm going to describe now. Beginning at time A, the water container is gradually heated, and the piston very slowly moves upward. At time B, the heating of the water stops, and the piston stops moving. And so we just described this constant pressure heating from A to B. Now, empty containers are placed on top of the piston, as shown. Small lead weights are gradually placed in the containers one by one, and the piston is observed to move down slowly. So we're putting weight on this and pushing it down. While this happens, the temperature of the water is nearly unchanged, and the gas temperature remains practically constant. It's sitting in this big container of water, surrounded by this large container of water that acts as a thermal reservoir. At time C, we stop adding weight to the container, and the piston stops moving. The piston is now at exactly the same position it was at the initial time, and so we've described the isothermal compression from B to C. Now the piston is locked into place, so it cannot move, and the weights are removed from the piston. It's left to sit in the room for many hours. During this time, it cools back to the original temperature. And so here, we've described the constant volume cooling from C to D. And this is a, we asked them a number of questions along the way. And tomorrow, I'll describe in more detail some of these questions and answers. Here, I'll just focus on this question six. Consider the entire process from A to D. Is the network done by the gas on the, on the environment during that process greater than, equal to, or less than zero? And the idea is that the work done in the BC process, the magnitude of that work is greater than the work done in the AB process. But the, uh, the BC work is negative, using the con sign convention that I, I discussed here. 
And so the net work done through this process is less than zero. And so the answer we're looking for is less than zero. What we found, however, is that only a very small percentage of students, both the introductory students and the advanced students, a very small percentage gave the correct answer. Instead, most of them claimed that the work done would be zero. This was pretty much a majority response for the introductory students and very popular for the advanced students as well. This is a typical explanation. The physics definition of work is like force times distance. And basically, if you use the same force and you just travel around in a circle and come back to your original spot, technically you did zero work. And you see that explanation sort of sounds plausible if you don't look at it too carefully. The other question we asked was about heat transfers, the heat, net heat transfer, total heat transfer, this, in the words of their textbook, during that process greater than, equal to, or less than zero. And of course, since it's a cyclic process, um, the net change in the internal energy is zero, so that the Q is equal to the W, the net Q is equal to the net W, and so the Q is negative, as was the, as was the work. The heat, net heat and net work were z net less than zero. So again, the answer is less than zero. And again, we find that very few students gave the correct answer. And again, most of the students claimed that it would be equal to zero. And the answers were rather reminiscent of the other answers. The heat transfer to the gas is equal to zero. The gas was heated up but still returned to its equilibrium temperature. So whatever energy was added to it was distributed back to the room. <clears throat> Most students thought that both the net heat transfer and the net work done had to be zero. And the results were very similar for the introductory students and the upper level students. So some of the strategies for instruction, and I'll discuss again this in more detail tomorrow, but uh, as, as the group, as Lubrud uh, and his collaborators pointed out, there has to be a lot more focus on an understanding of the work concept, even by these more advanced students. And the idea of work being an energy transfer mechanism. It's something that they don't really understand well. Also, we feel that getting the students to make more use of PV diagrams and to translate between a diagrammatic representation and a physical description of the type I just gave is potentially very helpful for the students. So we're working on a, developing a variety of um, research-based curriculum materials on a number of topics in thermal physics. We're testing these out both in the introductory courses and the more advanced courses. And I'm just going to say a few words about the one we've worked on recently. It's, car it's our current work. And uh, again, I'll talk about this more tomorrow. We gave a set of questions that asked about spontaneous processes. We said, consider a system undergoing a naturally occurring spontaneous process. The system can exchange energy with its surroundings. During this process, does the entropy of the system increase, decrease, or remain the same, or is this not determinable with the given information? And we asked the students to explain their answer. And then we asked the same question about the surroundings and about the total entropy, the entropy of the system plus the surroundings. Uh, and of course, since we haven't said anything about how the system is defined, you can't determine what happens to the system or the surroundings entropy. But since it's a naturally occurring spontaneous process, the total entropy has to increase. What we found is that the introductory students had uh, both before and after in structure had poor, had, had a low rate of correct responses to this question. So this is, this is before instruction, this is after instruction, there's hardly any difference. They just didn't do very well on these questions. Less than 40% correct. They tend to, to assume that the system em entropy always has to increase. They always think that entropy always increases, regardless of what, you're, what system you're talking about. And yet they still are, su are surprised that the total entropy of the system and the surroundings has to increase. So most students gave incor answer, incorrect answers to all those questions. The advanced students did a little bit better. This is their pre-instruction response and post-instruction a bit better, but still not as good as we had hoped. And this is without any specific research-based materials on this. So we have been developing, well, I should say that the advanced students, they do accept um, that the entropy of the system plus the surroundings increases. That's in contrast to the introductory students. But they also seem to think that the system entropy has to always increase without really thinking about what you mean by the system, which is an arbitrary definition. So Warren Christensen and I have been working on a tutorial that uh, guides students to think about these, uh, this situation. We have two large metal blocks, an insulated metal cube at low temperature, T sub L, and a, another insulated cube at high temperature connected by a thin, a narrow metal rod. And so there's a very slow heat transfer process. And these are like giant thermal reservoirs. So we asked the students to consider that heat transfer process 
and ask them whether the total energy changes during the process. We have a whole series of questions. I'm not going to go through them. We, the idea is we first ask them about the en energy change, which of course there is no energy change, energy is conserved, and then ask them about the entropy change, and actually entropy does increase in this process. What we do is we guide them to realize that the change in the entropy relates, can be, in this case, from, uh, gotten from the simple expression of the sum of the Q over T's. Um, and that the entropy change is greater than zero. And, and it's easy to see that in this case. And also to realize that the definition of system and surroundings is arbitrary. And we have some preliminary results which are promising. I'll just show you what it looks like. This is the pre-test, pre-instruction score on those questions. This is the post-instruction without using the tutorial. And then for the introductory students, this is the results we get after using the research-based tutorial. And then we also gave this question with intermediate students, sophomore, second year students. And we found that there was a good improvement from pre-instruction to post-instruction. Now these are preliminary results. That all I'm saying is that, that we seem to be going in the right direction. And so let me wrap up. Let me just summarize what I'm, the point I'm trying to make. It, we can, by doing this research on student learning, we can develop materials, instructional materials and instructional methods that hopefully are improved over the materials and methods that have been used before. By using the type of interactive engagement instruction that I described, with these research-based materials, we can potentially get real improvements in student learning. And as one improves student learning in one area, one learns new things about student thinking and finds new areas in which to do research and improve student learning in yet other areas. And so this gives the promise of continued progress, ongoing progress, in improving student learning in physics, um, hopefully as a continuing process far into the future. And <laughs> fortunately, I'm now done, so this doesn't matter. But uh, thank you very much for your attention. I'm, again, I'm uh, very happy to be there, and I'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you. questionnaires and tests and showing these letters during the lecture, they take time. Yes. So are you doing this course uh, the same amount of hours than normally? Or? It's, it's, it's the same number of hours. We do change the content a little bit. We typically do somewhat reduced number of topics. We do a little bit less, say about 20% less on that order. Other instructors, what they do is they, uh, they have the students, uh, they assign the students the extra topics as homework. So they don't cover it in class, they have the students do it at home. In my class, I'm satisfied just to not cover them because I think it, they're not critical. I'm more and, and so there's a little bit of a trade-off. You say, I want the students to have better understanding of a few things rather than try to get every single topic in there. So it does go more slowly, that's true. The, I, I believe my students do more at home, but it's, we don't have a good measure of that um, because different instructors are different in terms of how much they assign. My students certainly complained and said that we were giving them too much work at home, and so they said it was more work than in other courses. But that's just their statement, and I, I don't know if that's really true. Um, we would give them a lot of these qualitative questions and the non-quantitative problems, and they would have to think about them a lot. And, they were not as easy to do as those where they just had equations and they could just do some algebra. So, um, but we don't have a good measure, so I'm not, I'm, I'm not really sure of the answer. What's the way they are doing this work at home? Do they work in small groups as you suggested somewhere there? Many of them do. Again, if you're talking about at home, what they do at home. We, certainly we observe that many of them uh, do work together. Some of them come into, we have a help room, so-called help room where they can get assistance from instructors and they come in in groups there. But again, we don't have a good measure. What I'm telling you is what we observe, but we haven't done a careful investigation. And so I don't have a, a rigorous answer to how many of them work in groups compared to a normal situation. So I'm not sure. But we, it, that seems to be what we observe. Yeah, because, because the way you instruct them actually affects on how they 
to work together. We hope, actually, we encourage them to work together. We want them to do that. We feel that it would be useful for them. And we know that some of them do it. We don't know that, we don't know whether most of them do that, even though we hope that they do. Um, some of them, of course, like to work by themselves. We, some of them, and if they do, that's OK. Some students just don't want to work in a group. And we don't bother them. You know, if they're working by themselves, we just let them. Thank you for your interesting lecture. Just to clarify my own thinking, how long do you work with one group of students? For the whole semester, or just a few hours? It, um, it depends. I'm not exactly sure what you mean. Because sometimes they're, if, if we're working, if they're going through these tutorials, then that will typically, they'll all come in for a one hour period where they work, they, they each sit at a different table and they work together. And so we just walk around and we, we help, we walk from one group to the next. And that will be that same group will come in every week for 15 weeks. And it's usually 50, it's a 15 week. Now whether we get them the next semester, usually not. There would be a different group then. So 15 weeks typically. Do you need uh, modeling to students? What's that? Uh, modeling. What about modeling? Uh, do uh, students uh, do the, mm, themselves uh, models uh, from certain? Things like if you have a, a test and then try to work out the model to that. Are you are you asking whether we whether they do that or whether we try to get them to do that? I'm, I'm, well, are you, by the way, are you referring to the work that David Hessenes has done, the, the modeling method that has been publicized by David Hessenes or something specific or just a general method? And again, are you referring specifically to the work by David Hestonies or no, no? no something else? In, in general, yes. What's that? In general, about do you use modeling in the way? I, I think Bert is asking if you, for instance, you have a, some laboratory work or something, do you ask students to, to model the situation, for instance, qualitative or quantitative? We. Um, in the, it depends on the course. In some courses, I would say the answer is yes. In, in the course I described here, we, um, there, the opportunity was not really there for them to do that type of work where they have experiments and we ask them to develop models. But there are other courses that I haven't described here. For instance, the courses for teacher preparation where we have the, the students who are planning to teach either high school or elementary school. And in those classes, we have them do laboratory experiments where we ask them to um, come up with, uh, first we ask that we give them some equipment. And we ask them to make, we describe an experiment that we're going to, we plan to do. And we ask them to make predictions about what the experiment will show. And then we ask them to carry out the experiments and to describe what has happened. And I, I don't, in, in when I teach, I don't use the word model specifically. I don't talk about modeling, although other people do. But in effect, that's what we're asking them to do. We're asking them to come up with a description of the phenomenon, to put it in, um, to make whatever simplifications they need, to use the representations that are appropriate, to, for instance, use a drawing or a graph or some other representation, and then to test uh, and, and for them to, to see whether their, their models or their descriptions are an appropriate fit to what, their, to what they have observed and whether their results agree with what the other student groups have done. So I would say that the, the, the thing that you're referring to is something that we sometimes do in some classes, but we don't always have the opportunity to do it in all these classes. For instance, in the thermal physics course, we, we don't really have um, the, 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 phys the, uh, the ability to do those kind of experiments where it would be easy to have them do this kind of modeling. I'm interesting about the problem solving, and there is, uh, you mentioned that uh, you use that in group work. And uh, could you give some examples about interactions, what you give to students when they use problem solving in a group? The instructions? The directions? For example. For example. 
Um, well, it varies. Again, it really depends on the types of questions. There was the, the one I just described, which is where we have them do real laboratory work. And we ask them to treat it as a, as a scientific investigation. Where, and, and that could take a long time. That could take hours or days sometimes. But these other, the things that I was talking about here were really smaller problems, rather simple ones, where we, um, or, these, or there these tutorial worksheets, where they have a series of link problems. And they have about one hour, about 50 minutes, to go through uh, several pages of these problems. So they're not very complicated. And what we ask them is to w work through several of them on their own, and then to compare their answers with each other, and to discuss it. And then once they've come to a point of agreement or a point of disagreement, the instructor comes over and the instructor will listen to what they have to say and ask them some appropriate questions and then have them proceed if it sounds OK. Um, so it really depends on the specific learning context, um, um, the, the types of instructions that one would give. Now, I'm not sure that fully answers your question. Yes, the, the, the idea was that they you give the problem and they make the decision or solving together. That yes. Okay. Yes, and you know we would whether they do it together from the beginning or whether sometimes they just work on it by themselves and then they talk to each other and compare. That varies a lot, and we don't try to impose some set pattern on them. Okay. okay. I think there are at least two ways to use problems. One is to give. A uh, start with easy problems and then uh, give harder and harder problems and the step, uh, steps between the problems are small. Or then you other way is that uh, you give a very complex problem which is difficult and, uh, and start with that and then maybe go to the easier problems. So uh, what do you think about these options and did you use these both? Yeah, that's a good question because some instructors don't like to use these easy problems. They think that, well, for various reasons. And I will say that it depends on the student. It very much depends on the students. When we first started doing this, we were doing it at an institution in Louisiana where the students came in with very poor preparation. They had very little confidence in their abilities. They had very weak mathematical preparation. And if we simply tried to give them a very complicated problem, they couldn't do it. They wouldn't know how to start. They'd be very frustrated. It, it wouldn't work. And so we had to, in that situation, we had to give them these gentle, easy problems at first, and, and then to go a little harder, a little harder, because that's all they could do. Other students, however, are very clever and very well prepared. And if you give them easy problems, they, they're bored. They're not interested. They don't need it. And for those students, you can give them something really challenging and let them work on that. And, and uh, it might take them a little while, but it would, be, it would be very a good fit to them. And so the answer is, in my opinion, it very much depends on the students you're working with on the particular population of students. There's no one answer that is appropriate for every group of students. For most of the introductory students, most of the students in the introductory courses in most of the universities in, in the United States, I believe that they need this more gentle approach. But certainly, there are exceptions. And if you go to the uh, institutions where they're very selective and the students are very well prepared and, um, and very smart, then you probably would do you, In fact, I know you have to do it differently there, because people from Berkeley and people from Harvard have, have told me that they have to use a different type of problem for those students. So that's reasonable. I, I, I understand that it, it depends on the student. But it's a good point, because it emphasizes that you can't give a prescription of how to use this teaching method or any teaching method that is going to work the same for every group of students. There's, there are these many, many differences among the students and also with the instructors. So it, not everything will work for every instructor. The instructor has to, be, have to, has to feel comfortable with the teaching method that they're using. That's also important. So one has to find the appropriate fit. Well, that's a, a good question. Yeah. Uh, if we think about the teaching materials, uh, we, for example, con uh, say we meet some students who confront the Newton's law for the first time, and uh, we would like them to figure out some steps uh, to figure out the Newton's laws. Uh, do you think uh, we should give the material to students uh, 
at the time we teach it so that we don't like give them books beforehand so that they can read it and think they know it though they don't. Yeah, again, a good question. It, it, depends, on the, it depends on the situation. And, and so, sometimes I'll do it one way, and sometimes I'll do it a different way. <clears throat> so for instance, for the, when I was doing the course for the, teach, the teach, teacher preparation course, the, the, those who were going to be teaching uh, in, uh, say, the lower grades, um, elementary school, we decided to take a very slow approach and do it very, ma take many hours and do lots of experiments and, have, and not tell them what it was going to happen and have them figure out Newton's first law, Newton's second law, and so on. But it took a long time. For that group of students, it was appropriate, I think. On the other hand, for the more advanced students, perhaps, in the engineering course, um, I would, I might, and it, I haven't done this, I haven't taught that course in several years, so I'm not sure, but on some things, I might be willing to just tell them. And then other questions, like, Perhaps I'll tell them about Newton's first law, and, we'll, and then we'll do some experiments involving Newton's second law. Or maybe I will give them Newton's second law, and then we'll have some experiments where I will not tell them about Newton's third law. I'll have them make some predictions. They'll have to do something in the laboratory, because that's, Newton's third law is always, is, is very frequently a very confusing thing for even the, stu the engineering students. So it, I, the, again, there's no general answer. It will depend on the specific course and the specific students. Have you been able to advocate this new <coughs> teaching methods to your, your colleagues? Yes, and again, the, the response is um, there's no, no uniform response. I would say that most instructors are sympathetic to some aspects of it. And they, for instance, many instructors in the United States have begun to use these response systems, the clicker systems where they uh, ask the students a question and the students respond by, with these electronic systems. So they, they like that idea and some of them have begun to use it. However, they're very, that, that's in, from, in many cases, they won't do more than that. They won't do the qualitative questions, they won't do the question sequences. They just, they're, they just want to try it out. Uh, now there are other instructors and they tend to be the newer ones, I would say, on the average, that are more enthusiastic, and they're more enthusiastic about using the new curricula and to, to use the research-based materials and to, and to make bigger changes in their classes. But of course, they haven't been teaching very long. If you've been teaching for 30 years, you, know, you, wanna, you don't want to change everything you've done and rewrite all your notes. I mean, I've been in, I'm in that situation, too. I don't, it's, you're reluctant to make a big change. People who come in who've only, who've only started teaching last year, they're a little bit more willing to try new things. But that's understandable. That's natural. Seems to be everything is clear. So tomorrow we closing the with thermal physics. It's a discussion. It's wonderful. Good afternoon. Okay. Okay, thank you, David. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much.